These last few days have been some of the hardest we've ever had. Michiganders are strong, but we are brokenhearted right now. Last week, an unthinkable horror came to Michigan. Students ran and hid as a gunman, alleged to be their own classmate, shot and killed four of them. 16-year-old Tate Meir, 14-year-old Hannah St. Juliana, 17-year-old Justin Schilling, and 17-year-old Madison Baldwin. Six others and a teacher were wounded. And the whole community is left to cope. This community may be remembered for this tragedy, but it won't be defined by it. And your presence tonight, standing together, is testament to that. Unfortunately, the tragedy that hit Oxford High School in Metro Detroit is far too common. Even since the days before the attack on Columbine in Colorado, school shooting survivors have multiplied across the country. And while a court case has to now play out for the accused, Officials have to review what could have stopped it, and lawsuits are levied. It's those survivors who know what's next in the day-to-day lives of those most impacted. It may seem impossible now, on this night of unspeakable pain, that anything like joy could be in our future. But I have faith that there is a peace that comes. On today's episode, we speak with the former principal of Columbine, a Parkland survivor, a Santa Fe survivor and the father of a Columbine student who never made it home. They tell us the healing process they underwent in the wake of atrocity, in hopes it may help the community in Oxford and in our state overall. In this episode, you won't be hearing a lot from me, because we just wanted to listen. I'm Carrie Near the Second, and this is On the Line. We'll remember this night, of course, and we'll remember Hannah, Justin, Madison and Tate, and we will commit to ourselves to do whatever we can in their memory to prevent this horror from visiting another family or another community again. Thank you and God bless you. Just to start, can you introduce yourself, uh, give me your name, your age, and, and how you're related to the incidents, um, like the one that happened at Oxford? Uh, my name is uh, Frank DeAngelis, and uh, I was a principal at Columbine, and I ended up uh, in my third year as principal on April 20th, 1999, the Columbine shooting happened. Uh, my name is Chase Arbro. Uh, I'm 21 years old, and uh, May 18th, 2018, um, you know, Santa Fe High School, we had an incident with a school shooter and uh, I was shot. I'm Carly Novell. I'm 21 years old. And um, when I was 17, I was at school on Valentine's Day. Um, and when the shooting happened at Stoneman Douglas, it was not in the building. Um, I was in a closet in my newspaper classroom and um, it was still traumatic. My name is Tom Mauser. I'm 69 years old, and I am the father of Daniel Mauser, who was one of the students killed at Columbine High School in 1999. He was 15 years old when he was killed. He was a um, sophomore. He was a very, very uh, intelligent student. He was a straight-A student, but a very, very, very shy, uh, very lovable kid. He liked to play video games. He liked to follow current events. Wow. And, and what, I, what I most admire about Daniel was that he, he's someone who took on his weaknesses. He, he was so shy, and yet he chose to join the debate team at Columbine. He was one of the best debaters they had. Can you take us to that day? And what was your experience in the days shortly after? So uh, it was, you know, a normal day in school, you know, uh, art period, first period. I walked, walked in there and I was kind of behind. So I was trying to hurry up and do stuff before we actually started the class. And uh, before I know it, I seen somebody walk by and I was kind of a little suspicious. And I, I didn't think nothing of it. And then um, so we, we heard the gunshots down the hallway. I remember me, me personally, I was like frozen. It felt like I was frozen. I was just like, didn't know what was going on. I was looking around. And um, our first instinct, we always, you know, try to go through, uh, go to like a closet of some sort to get in a safe spot. But everybody, there was just too many of us in that room. And we all decided to all split up. So I remember 
myself. I, I try to hide. I try to climb into something to keep myself uh, like hidden. And I jumped to something and I was like, oh, this is a terrible spot. I need to get out. So uh, I jumped out and I remember looking around like, where's he at? Where's he at? And then shortly after that, I heard a gunshot and I collapsed. I blacked out. When I when I woke up from you know being blacked out, I looked at the window of the door and it was all busted. So I originally thought it was like glass, like you know, cut me and everything else because I was bleeding everywhere. So I was like, oh, there's no way I got hit. So I got up, left the closet, and left through the other art room's back door and uh, successfully you know got away. I surely after called my father and he found me. It wasn't until I got to the hospital they ran a couple X-rays and the doctor walked in. He goes, okay, well yeah, uh, you have a bullet near your skull. You have a bullet entered through your back. You have one through your arm. I, that's when I realized that I was hit. I'm very lucky to be here. Um, I was in my office that day and I was getting ready to go to lunch duty. And I was talking to a teacher. I was getting ready to offer him a job. He was on a one-year contract. But uh, as we were sitting down, ready to start that conversation, my secretary comes running towards the door and she said, there's a report of gunfire. And so in my mind, I'm thinking this has to be a senior prank. So it wasn't registering until I came out of my office and then about 100 yards away, my worst nightmare became a reality because the gunman was coming towards me. And so I had about 20, 25 girls that were coming out of a locker room to go to a physical education class. They were unaware what was happening, but they were right in the crossfire. So I got down to them. But I knew in my mind that if I was able to get the girls into the gymnasium, then there were doors that would aggress outside that would allow them to get to a safe place. But I pull on the gym door and it's locked. So we're trapped in this little alcove hall or in this little hallway. The gunman's actually coming around the corner. I reached in my pocket and the first key I pulled out of my, out, when it came out of my pocket, I stuck in the door and it opened on the first try. And if I didn't, I truly believe that if I didn't find that key on the first try, girls and I probably would have died that day. That day was, was really a, a horrendous 24 hours because it started with First getting the news that something was happening at the school. There were 2,000 students at Columbine. So I thought, well, gee, what are the chances that, that something would happen to Daniel? That just that wouldn't, wouldn't be the case. I was at a school where there were police and parents gathered together waiting to get news. And at one point they asked the parents whose students hadn't been accounted for to go into a separate room. And they had counselors in there. You're wondering, <laughs> well, how good this can, can this be if they're if they've got counselors with us. And I, I could only stand to be there about 45 minutes, not getting any news. So I went home and, and it wasn't until the next day at noon that we were officially notified by the, by the police that Daniel was one of the victims. First, we were just sitting in class and then a fire alarm went off. Um, we already had a fire drill that day, so it was kind of weird to have another one, but we just walked out of the classroom and as we were walking out, um, there were some administrators nearby and they said, it's a code red, go back inside. Um, so we went back inside. We were sitting in the classroom. Um, I, I didn't know it was a shooting until I saw my teacher texting her husband. And then I was like, oh, this is real. And then from there, we moved into the closet. It was about 20 of us in a, like a small utility closet and we waited there for probably an hour and a half or two hours until a SWAT came and got us. And then in the, in the days following, I did a few interviews and that, that part I, I kind of regret because it, it just was, I wasn't prepared for, for that. I was in newspaper. I'm a journalism major in school and I, I kind of felt like I had an obligation to talk about it. And I also like wanted to help reporters with their stories. But at the same time, there's a level of sensitivity that you have to approach when it's so soon after an event, especially for people who aren't even 18 yet. And a lot of times I didn't receive that sensitivity and eventually I like I took a step back because I realized this is not good for me and I need to just process and think about everything myself instead of talking to reporters about it. 
Actually, the uh, the county provided um, a counselor at our home who kind of gave us a little bit of an idea of what to expect and said, you know, don't be speaking to the media if you don't feel like it. Be aware that this can be very tough on your marriage. But frankly, after a while, that person was just a little too overbearing for my wife, and she asked her to leave our home. It was this very, very difficult time. Um, shortly after we had a uh, like a memorial type deal where we all went back to school and we had like a all of us met up in the gym. Through that process, you know, I was just feeling like overwhelmed with emotions. You know, I, I questioned a lot, like why this would have happened, and like what what would made him do this. And of course, it's not, it's it's hard to search for something that you can't find the answer for. And, um, you know, I was, I was really shocked about losing, you know, friends and teachers. It's it, a lot of the, a lot of the people, a lot of the 10, the 10 people that passed away in ours, it was just a lot of that art classroom was a great thing because knowing each other, we all were close and everything. And then sadly it's, um, one of my really close friends, Chris Stone. Um, I grew up with a kid he was a, um, we played football together and, uh, he was, you know, maybe he, he was, he was a really funny kid. We talked and joked every day. We always played games and uh, things like that. I received a phone call within 24 hours from a friend. He was a Vietnam vet. He said, if you don't help yourself, you can't help anyone else. And so I was in counseling then. I'm in counseling now. I asked if we could wait a couple of weeks to go back. And the superintendent and school board press said, why? I said, we have 13 memorial services we needed to go to. And the last thing that I wanted was you know, our kids and staff members to go to a memorial service and then try to go to a class to learn English or math. And so we did return. But one of the things I had to do is just dealing when we went back to school, parents worrying about whether or not our school was safe, you know, the aftermath. And one of the things that I can assure, whether it be what's happening right now in Oxford, what happened in Parkland, we could all experience the same event, but how we deal with it in the aftermath is different. And we had people that needed to talk, talk, talk. Others are saying, as soon as I get back to doing what I was doing prior, that's going to help me heal. And so that was probably one of the most difficult uh, tasks I had is trying to meet the needs of everyone. We'll be right back. I'm Melissa Robinson for the Detroit Free Press. When you wake up every morning, what's the first thing you do? Check your email? Me too. And when you sign up for our daily briefing newsletter, you'll get all the latest news sent directly to your inbox so you can wake up and be ready for the day. We also have newsletters about COVID-19 in Michigan, the latest entertainment headlines, as well as Woodward 248, a newsletter specifically for people living and working in Southeast Oakland County. And don't forget about automotive headlines and all the latest news from our Michigan sports teams. We have a newsletter Letter for every personality and preference. Just head to freep.com forward slash newsletters to sign up for any one of these great options and more. And we're back listening to school shooting survivors Carly Novell and Chase Yarbrough, parent Tom Mauser, and former principal Frank DeAngelis. And so let's talk about like the beginning of that process. What what made you start to really process those things and what were those initial moments like when you were able to cope with what had happened? Um, I, at some points, it still feels surreal. That's Parkland survivor Carly Novell. I don't know if it's there's a moment that I started processing. For a while, I felt like I wasn't like valid in my feelings. I wouldn't call myself a survivor because I felt like my life wasn't in danger. But... At the same time, I was really close to this event and I, I was in a closet and I experienced the community and, and I went to funerals. So being a survivor doesn't always mean you were right there. But it was still traumatic in its own way. Just, it, I'm just shocked about the whole thing. And uh, of course, it left, it left other impacts, you know, PTSD to this day and other things. Santa Fe survivor Chase Yarbrough. I became way more aware of my surroundings. I'm always looking around and everything. In school, it was really hard to focus because more likely I was always looking at the door of class. So when I go to the restaurant, I always like to look at the door, see who comes in, see who comes out and everything. And um, it's, it's just, yeah, it's, just, it's small things like that 
to me, but just, I, I don't know, it's kind of hard or uh, like standing still in spots. You know, I, my friends, we usually like to go out to eat and uh, sit down and just talk forever. But uh, me, I just, I really, nowadays I really can't because I'm just kind of, I'm, I'm just so scared to sit in one spot. Counseling has been super great. You know, um, I felt like a weight's off my chest when I talked to a counselor because it's, it's never good to bottle it up and everything. And I was just shook. I, I kind of just kept everything to myself because I didn't want to believe it was real. And I didn't want to believe that what happened happened. So I just kind of kept everything in and didn't really express myself. And um, that's what it was so great about people like other survivors and counselors is I can express myself, tell them, um, you know, why, why I feel certain type ways. And it's, it's good. It makes you feel good. Just physically, how, how are you? Um, I think as the day goes by, I'm, you know, I feel like I'm getting better and better. The biggest support was just my friends. We would, after the shooting, we would hang out every day, just drive around. Um, and, and that was pretty much it. Did y'all discuss it? Was talking about it helpful? Yeah. And it was just nice to have people who understood because my parents really wanted me to talk to them, but it was just hard to talk about and they because they had their own experience in it as well it was it was difficult the mental toll it took ever since then my my ability to focus especially in school has been not like I haven't been able to focus as well in school also just whenever we did work at school after I was just like this feels useless what's the point of this and that has kind of continued it's, it's something that no parent is really prepared for daniel mauser's father tom mauser you you just you just don't expect to have your child murdered and you know and, you, and you're asking yourself this question why why my son you know why of the of the 12 students that were shot why did they why did they pick out pick out daniel we, we found healing in a few different ways. Uh, one, it was certainly really helpful for us to meet with the, uh, on a pretty regular basis, the parents of the other students who were killed. And other things for us, we wanted something to look forward to in a hopeful way. Uh, we decided to adopt a baby girl from, from China as, as a way of giving the time that we would have given to Daniel. We thought, okay, let's give this time to another child. We established a website for Daniel within a few months of Columbine. We, uh, I became very involved in the, in the gun control movement uh, because of words that Daniel said to me uh, prior to Columbine. It was about two weeks before the, uh, the tragedy at Columbine that um, Daniel asked me, Dad, did you know there are loopholes in the Brady Bill? Then two weeks later was killed with a gun that was purchased through a loophole in the Brady Bill. The shooters at Columbine bought three of their four weapons at a gun show with no background check, no paperwork, no questions asked. So that, that, that really resonated with me, and I felt that this was how I would, um, how I would follow up. Wow. And, and how, has, how has the impact of what you've experienced changed over time? You know, I think that's the key word, over time. Um, it's, it's, it's a long process. You, 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 just, you, just, you do not get over the loss of a child like this. You learn to deal with it. Um, it becomes a, a little bit easier with the passage of time. And you, it's, you, you have to go into that stage of acceptance. When I first went back into Columbine, I was having flashbacks to what I experienced that day. Former Columbine principal, Frank DeAngelis. And my counselor said, if you're going to continue to be the principal of this high school, you need to change that mindset. And, he's, and he had me talk about each of the kids who lost their lives. He said, tell me something about Lauren Townsend. Because he said, if all you remember in seeing her lying in a pool of blood, you're never going to be able to go back in that building. So I said, she played volleyball. Tell me about Isaiah Schultz. He was down in the cafeteria and he gave me a high five each and every day. So I was changing that mindset. And so it was not, never forget, I came up with the term a time to remember, but a time for hope. And so I had to make sure that I changed that mindset if I was going to continue to do it. And I think a lot of times, it, whether you know it's services for funerals or memorial services, you really want to celebrate life. And that's, that's the tough thing at mourning that death. But that was one of the things that really helped me. 
unfortunately, we had situations uh, in the aftermath. Uh, we had some students that struggled and unfortunately took their own lives. And we saw an increase in drugs and alcohol. And so you got to reach out and leaders in that community have to say, is what are we going to do? We need to come together and help each other. Uh, I had little kids write me cards. I, I still hold them to this day. You know, I had kids write me letters saying, I hope you get better, Chase. And uh, I had uh, people draw me, uh, like make me artwork. They sent it to me. I had people across the country. You know, it made me feel really good knowing that I was not alone. And I had letters. I had letters from other communities, uh, other school shootings. But uh, when I interacted with more of the, um, so it was the Sandy Hook Promise. I was able to, you know, get in contact with a lot of the other um, school uh, school shooting survivors and uh, got really close. And we still to this day we have a group chat. We text on the daily and everything. And uh, it's it's really good. It it's definitely changed over time, and it was difficult going into college after that, after experiencing that and living on my own. And I go to school in DC. So I had a lot of friends that were at school in Florida and it was just hard to be away from home. After my freshman year, I went home for a semester and went to school nearby because I also didn't really have any therapy or any mental help. And I was just trying to do school and it wasn't going great for me. Um, So then I came back to GW where I go to school and the pandemic happened. So it's been a really weird process and it doesn't feel like it's been almost four years. Sometimes it feels like it was really recent and it, but it also so much has happened since. I think there's a lot of desensitization that's happened since um, I used to, after every shooting that happened after, I would get really, really upset. And it's just every time it would get less, I would get less and less emotional and kind of more frustrated to see the ways it could have been prevented. What was the step that transitioned you from grief, from, from sadness, from anger to, you know, eventually acceptance? I think the biggest thing for me was just really asking myself one specific question. What would Daniel want? Hmm. Would Daniel want me to be in perpetual grief and not able to go on and not have a happy life? And I had to say to myself, no, that's not what Daniel would want. You're in a really uh, unique situation uh, because you understand what the children and the parents and administrators and somebody I've gone through and, and what the community is going through at this time in Oxford. Um, what can you tell us about the journey to healing for them and, and for us as a state? You know, I, I think that there's going to be some potentially some real difficulty in Oxford because I see some ties to the tragedy of Columbine where there, you know, there are certainly questions about the, the actions of the, the parents in your case as there was in ours, questions, legitimate questions about how the school reacted. And there are no doubt going to be lawsuits. Don't let it pull you apart. And and also don't let the Oxford Strong movement be one that's, that's, that's really designed to say, let's just move on. We have to get over this. No, you know, you, you need to, you need to honor those who lost their lives. You need to remember them and celebrate their lives and, and try not to let the controversies bring you down I, my prayers are out to y'all i just want y'all to i just want y'all to know that this this will be better i know it's, it's going through hard times and everything but uh things will be better just to give yourself time and yeah let yourself feel or or not sometimes you don't don't know what to feel and that's okay too. I made a comment back in the day that I just joined a club in which no one wants to be a member. I'm part of a network. I'm heading up a network called the Principal Recovery Network, which is part of the NASSP, the National Association of Secondary School Principals. And there are 51 of us, I think, part of that group that have been involved in uh, school shootings. 
And so uh, we really reach out and uh, to help these communities uh, that go through the problems that they're going through, uh, lessons learned. When I do my presentation, what I state wholeheartedly, I refuse to be helpless. I refuse to be hopeless and I refuse to give in. And I am going to be there to help them every step of the way. And my condolences are out there and whatever they need, uh, I'm there for them. And I just, uh, I just wish I could, you know, ma- wave a magic wand and let the hurt go away. I can't, but all I can do is be there for them and for you. Before we go, a big thanks to Susan Vella, Sandy Hook Promise, Kevin Simpson, and Frank Scandale. This episode was produced by me, Darcy Moran, and Tad Davis, with help from Peter Majerly. Ajanette Delgado and Marianne Struman are our executive producers. Peter Bati is our editor. The music for the show is called Fort Trumbull and was produced by DJ Lost Boy. Thanks for listening. And if you like the show, leave a rating and subscribe. See you next week.